Hi, welcome as we celebrate Palm Sunday. And our theme this morning will look at Jesus entering Jerusalem in the final days before he is sent to the cross. But before we get there, we want to take a moment and remember that God has not left us in the storm, that he has not forgotten us. There's a song called Rescue, and some of the words in it reflect what God is saying to us. He says that there's never been a moment you were forgotten. I hear your SOS, and I'll send an army to find you, and in the darkest night, I will rescue you. So those are wonderful words, especially in this time of uncertainty. So we'll start off our worship. Uh, Jen will sing this song, then Steve will pray. And may God bless you as you participate in this worship. Let me open with a word of prayer. Dear God, we thank you for your presence with us and that you're always there. You're never leaving us or forgetting us. So may this time be a sacred time and may you speak to our hearts and minds as we reflect on who you are in our lives and in our world. Amen. Wherever you are, let's join together in prayer. Dear God, today on Palm Sunday, we remember the day when our Savior Jesus Christ entered Jerusalem in glory, but later that same week would die on a cross. We praise you, Lord Jesus, for your amazing love. You died on the cross on our behalf and took the punishment that we deserve. We praise you for the gift of salvation that when we accept it, saves us, and gives us eternal life. We join with those who shout, Hosanna! Blessed is he who comes in the name of the Lord. Thank you, Heavenly Father, for what this day stands for, the beginning of the Holy Week, the start of the journey towards the power of the cross, the victory of the resurrection, and the truth that Jesus is our King of kings and Lord of lords. 
Dear Lord, the news about the pandemic is unsettling. Changes in how we live and how we interact with each other makes us anxious. We worry about our friends, neighbors, and loved ones. On this day, O oh God, we look to you for comfort, for strength, and most of all, for courage. You, Lord, are the everlasting God, our good shepherd, and our loving Father who loves us beyond understanding. Gracious Creator, please bring stability and renewal to families who have been disrupted by the coronavirus and the job losses that resulted from it. For those of us in our church and for all who are watching, we pray for healing for those who are sick or recovering, for comfort for those who are grieving, and for your peace and wisdom for those who are challenged in other ways. In particular, please give comfort for the family of our brother Greg Anderson who passed away a few days ago. Lord Jesus, we pray earnestly for the medical doctors, nurses, and healthcare workers who are putting their lives on the line for us. Please give them strength and immunity during this time. We also pray for those who keep us going during this time, including firemen, food preparers, grocery store workers, mail carriers, police, and trades workers. Dear Lord, we ask that this Holy Week, that we may see it in a new way, the wonderful message that you bring to us, a message of peace and love, a message of grace and reconciliation, and a message of new life to all those who believe. In the name of the risen Christ we pray, amen. Thank you very much.
Today we start what is traditionally called Holy Week. And you can see from the picture, it starts with Palm Sunday. On Thursday, Jesus shares a Passover meal with his disciples. Uh, Friday, he has a trial. He's crucified, uh, put in the tomb. And then Easter next week, uh, there's resurrection. Uh, but today we, we start with this uh, entry into Jerusalem. There's eight events that are mentioned in all four Gospels, and this is one of them. So we know that from the writer's perspective that this entry into Jerusalem was very important. So let's take a look at this. The next day, a great crowd that had come for the festival heard that Jesus was on his way to Jerusalem. And they took palm branches, and they went out to meet him, shouting, Hosanna, blessed is the one who comes in the name of the Lord. Blessed is the king of Israel. So uh, with the palm branches, that's where we get the name uh, Palm Sunday. But Hosanna, that's a word that was used often in celebrations. For instance, when a, a general was returning from a victory at war, uh, they would shout Hosanna. And uh, at this point, when Jesus comes in, there's a excitement and electricity in the city of Jerusalem. And so when he enters in, they shout Hosanna as one who comes as a victor, as someone who is coming to help them. But here's what it says. Jesus found a young donkey, sat on it as it is written. Do not be afraid, daughter Zion. See, your king is coming, seated on a donkey's colt. Uh, so what do we make of, of this scene, and how do we look at the people who are involved in this? And as I look at it, we're looking at expectations, and that uh, Jesus didn't exactly meet what they thought was going to happen, that their expectations were one way, and Jesus was going another way. It reminds me of when I went fishing with my brother. Uh, he had a boat out of Half Moon Bay, and so the plan was uh, we'd go out, uh, catch some fish, enjoy the day. And as we started off, it was uh, beautiful, sunny. We were expecting a, a wonderful, fun day of fishing. But before long, it, it got dark, and it began to look stormy. And then pretty quickly, uh, a fog came in. And, and we couldn't see the, the land, the shore. And uh, this is before... GPS is on phones, so we're talking dark ages and uh, prehistoric times, but there's no GPS. Uh, sometimes boats had them, but my brother's GPS was out, so of course we didn't know where we were. So what we had to do was kind of get close enough to shore to see if we could see any landmarks, but not get caught in the waves and get pushed into shore. So we did this a, a couple of times. It was pretty scary. When you're in a place, the ocean all of a sudden feels very scary and unfamiliar. And in my mind, I was thinking, oh, man, I hope we don't get pushed into the shore, you know, mess up the boat, or maybe even worse, you know, end up stranded somewhere. But uh, it ended up, we, we found the harbor, got in, I'm here, I'm safe, and we can laugh about it now, but the expectations of a fun day of fishing didn't happen. And so as you look at expectations, we want to look again at, at this story and what didn't happen. Because when Jesus came in and the crowd shouted, Hosanna, which is, you know, save us, rescue us now, that what they were expecting was maybe something like a, a warrior king to come in and kick out the Romans. But they didn't get that. It says, look, your king is coming to you. He is humble, riding on a donkey, riding on a donkey's colt. And so when they were hoping for a mighty warrior, you know, it's, it says a donkey's colt, he's, and that's a baby donkey. So I don't think it looked exactly like this, but it's not the magnificent uh, steed that they were hoping for. Jesus comes in on a, a baby donkey riding in as the one who comes to rescue them. And the Pharisees, what were they expecting? They were there, and it said, the blind and the lame came to him in the temple. And he healed them 
and the leading priests and the teachers of the religious law saw all these wonderful miracles. And they heard even the children of the temple shouting, praise God for the son of David. And, you know, this, this bothered them because he was this Jesus who wasn't really taking their side but was accepting praise from kids uh, for being the, the son of David, for taking on these important roles, and it threatened them. And then Jesus went into the temple, and it says he entered the temple, and he began to drive out all the people buying and selling animals for sacrifice. And he said to them, the scriptures declare, my temple will be called a house of prayer, but you have turned it into a den of thieves. So Jesus comes in and it says they were indignant. And not only were they indignant, it said they were envious, they were fearful, because Jesus was coming in and he wasn't being with them. It often, he was opposed to them. And instead of affirming who they were, that he was saying, no, you're, you're getting it all wrong. And it threatened the Pharisees and, and the religious leaders because Rome allowed them to stay in control because if they kept the people in control, they could stay in power. But if the people got out of control, then they would lose their, their place. And then what about the disciples? Uh, they were often confused about what Jesus was teaching and saying. And here it says this. From then on, Jesus began to tell his disciples plainly that it was necessary for him to go to Jerusalem and that he would suffer many terrible things at the hands of the religious leaders. He would be killed, but on the third day, he'd be raised from the dead. And this is confusing because he was the Messiah. He was the one, the anointed one. And to say he was going to suffer and then die, that, that made no sense to them. And Peter took him aside, Jesus, and he began to reprimand him and saying such things. Heaven forbid, Lord, he said, this will never happen to you. Because that was the expectation, that Jesus would come, that he would set up his kingdom, that yeah, he would set things right. And for him to die, again, that just didn't make any sense. And as he heads to Jerusalem, it's interesting, Thomas, who we know as Doubting Thomas, was also nicknamed the twin. And he said to his fellow disciples, let's go too and die with Jesus. <laughs> it's kind of a practical, funny thing, but yeah, he wants to go to Jerusalem. Okay, we'll go, but we're all going to die. Because that's what they would thought. They, they knew that they were out to get Jesus, but Jesus was not doing the reasonable, rational thing and said he went to Jerusalem. And Jesus often had to say to, say to them, how foolish you are and how slow to believe because he didn't understand so much of what he was saying. <laughs> Makes me think, that hey, would have been a good disciple. You know, I'm kind of slow. Don't always pick up on what Jesus is trying to do. But that's where his followers were. And so expectations. It wasn't what they expected. So what did they do? And as we know, the religious leaders decided to kill Jesus. And that was their plan. And the disciple, or the, the crowd, uh, too, were asked this question. Pilate said, look, here's your king. And he presented Jesus to them. And hopefully, Pilate thought, well, we'll release him because they'll be supportive of Jesus. Because just a few days ago, the crowd was yelling, Hosanna, blessed is the one who comes in the name of the Lord. But what did the crowd say? They said, away with him. Away with him, crucify him. So from Hosanna to crucify him in just a short period of time because the crowd didn't get it either. And the disciples thought that Jesus was dead and that the mission was over. And Peter later would say, hey, I'm, I'm done with this. Let's go fishing. And so he thought, the disciples thought, that was the end of the story. But as we know, that wasn't the end of the story. But we'll get into that next week. But for now, the disciples felt lost and confused. And so for us, as we look at this story, what about our expectations? How do we see Jesus? 
and some of the things that he says to us. Because we do have expectations of what God is going to do and how Jesus works in our life. For instance, you know, when you're a Christian, you think, hey, I'm on Jesus' side now. Life should, should be easy, and things should be joyful and wonderful, and I'll get everything I want. And, you know, Jesus and I, we're, we're buddies, so it's all going to be a piece of cake. And so we think, now we're, we're set. And so we kind of look at uh, life like this. And I don't know if you know what this is. This is a lazy boy chair. It's a recliner. And, and you can see in the picture here that uh, it's not just a recliner. There is a little refrigerator in one of the, the side arms that you could put your cold drinks in. And it has a remote control that you could push it up and down. It's like, that is luxurious. And I thought, that's, that's kind of what we think. You know, once we get with Jesus, we're good. But you think this is good? I saw this other thing. This is an Osaka OS 4000T. <laughs> this is a great Father's Day present. It's like, look at that. It's, it's huge. It's like you could just live in that thing in, in total comfort. And sometimes we think that's what God is offering us. Here's an easy chair. Hey, Garrett, relax. I got it covered. Life is a piece of cake. But then Jesus says this. He says to his disciples, if anyone wants to be my follower, you must give up your own way and take up your cross and follow me. You go, what? What happened to the comforter? You're asking me to take up a cross? That's not what I was expecting, Jesus. Well, I expected things to go easy, n not to move into a sacrificial life. And Jesus says, here on earth you will have many trials and sorrows. But take heart, I've overcome the world. Hey, Jesus, if you've overcome the world, uh, how come there's trials and sorrows? Isn't that supposed to go away? But Jesus says the opposite, that I have overcome the world, but you will still have many trials, many sorrows. But that's the way it goes. And so what do we do with, with these words when what we expect isn't what we get? And the disciples and those that were following Jesus came to the same difficult decision too. When Jesus was talking about his body and his blood and, and eating his, his body and that he was uh, the bread of life, many of the followers didn't understand it. And so it says at this point, many of his disciples turned away and deserted him. And then Jesus turned to the 12 and asked, are you also going to leave? It was a good question because a lot of his followers were saying, nope, that's as far as I can go. I can't understand this, so I'm taking off. But Peter says this. He replied, Lord, to whom would we go? You have the words that give eternal life. And we believe and we know that you are the Holy One of God. And so Peter reaffirms that even if I don't understand, where else would we go? And so for us too, that maybe life doesn't always make sense, but we know that Jesus is our Lord and Savior. So finding ways to allow his words to take hold in our hearts, because that's what leads to life, an eternal life. So again, I want to encourage you during this Lenten time, and especially as we're sheltering in place, you have time uh, to read his word. And whether it's reading the Gospels or reading this whole Holy Week story, or maybe reading Romans, uh, reading Ephesians, uh, Sermon on the Mount, but letting the words of, of our Lord take hold in your heart. And so Hosanna, God to the rescue. Blessed be the one who comes in the name of the Lord. Uh, that Jesus did come to save, but not in the way that the crowd expected, not in the way the Pharisees expected. It says this, And she, Mary, will have a son, and you are to name him Jesus, for he will save his people from their sins.
that when a rescuer comes, it's, it's not necessary to take away the oppressions or the difficulties or the challenges or the hurts of life, that Jesus is here to rescue us from something much more deeper, much more significant. The things that are happening in, in our lives, inside of us, that even in the midst of difficulty, that he heals our brokenness or our sin, that he comes to restore who we are, who we're meant to be, and that's how he saves us. It says, for you know that God paid a ransom to save you from the empty way of life you inherited from your ancestors. And so he's talking about life, but not this life that sometimes we see around us where we want things, possessions, popularity, power, all the good stuff. There's something more to life. And he came to save us from the, the worldly perspective, the world's perspective on, on what life is. Because Jesus says, that's sometimes very empty. And it was not paid for with mere gold or silver, which lose their value. It was the precious blood of Christ, the sinless, spotless lamb of God. And so that's why Jesus says to us, don't store up treasures here on earth where moths eat them and rust destroys them and where thieves break in and steal. Because we can spend all of our time gathering things around us. But Jesus says, no, those things can be lost. But seek first the kingdom of God above all else and live righteously and he will give you everything you need. So Jesus, the rescuer, the one who comes in the name of the Lord, tells us to go a different way, seeking first the kingdom of God. And so I want to suggest to you that Jesus offers to each of us Hosanna moments, especially in this time of difficulty and confusion, where we're sheltering in place, we don't know what the future holds. And so here are some things that maybe might be an encouragement to you to think about that Jesus will be with us in our confusion, in our sadness when we do feel lost. You know, because we are in uncharted territories, we, we've never faced anything like this as a, as a church, as a community, as individuals, as families, as nations. And so we can have that sense of, of feeling alone and lost. But Jesus says, I will not abandon you as orphans. And I will ask the Father, and he will give you another advocate, the Holy Spirit, who will never leave you. That in the midst of maybe our lostness, that Jesus reaffirms that he will never leave us, and that he always has his eye on us, that we're not alone. And also, we're, not only are we not alone with, with God, that he is there, but we have one another. So now Jesus and the ones he makes holy have the same father. And that is why Jesus is not ashamed to call them his brothers and his sisters. That as we come to Christ, not only do we have a relationship with God, but we have a relationship with each other, with the, the church body. And here in our church, you know, God has given us family. And so I want to remind you, you know, stay connected. And, and write a text, an email, send a card, uh, make a phone call. Because as we are isolated from one another, it can be lonely for some people. And so make it an effort to reach out to your, not just your family, but your church family as well. And, you know, in this time where panic is all around us, because there's a lot of stuff to panic about, to be f fearful about, to be scared about. But if that consumes us, Jesus is saying, I've come to rescue you from that. And I give peace. I give a gift that the world cannot give, so don't be troubled or afraid. And I've mentioned this verse before, but especially when we are panicky, that God is saying, I want to give you peace. And so I want to remind you that you can believe in Jesus' words, that it's a gift that we can't give ourselves, the world cannot give it, but Jesus can offer that to us. And rest. <laughs> I don't know about you, I'm tired, and everything seems to take longer, it's harder, you know, shopping, being careful about uh, staying separate, so everything is kind of thrown up in the air. And 
I, I can tell I'm tired because my family senses I'm tired too because when I'm tired, I get a little bit of cranky and not as uh, patient and so they notice that, hey, that answer was a little sharp or that's not as, uh, watch that tone because it doesn't sound quite right and I can tell that even though I try to maintain some normalcy, that it takes a lot of energy and that rest is something that I could use. And, and not just physical rest, but a, a deeper rest. And that's what God offers too. Jesus said, come to me, all you who are weary and carry heavy burdens, and I will give you rest. So it's a matter of coming back to Jesus and taking that gift of, of rest for us. And take my yoke upon you. Let me teach you because I am humble, as we saw him coming in on a donkey, and gentle at heart, and you'll find rest for your souls. So not just physical rest, but our deeper rest, a rest that refreshes our souls. And that's something I think we could all use. And it is a time when I sense that there may be people who are feeling hopeless. If they see the statistics, they wonder what is going to lie ahead, and it's going to get worse before it gets better. And so in this chaos, God does offer hope. And he says that, you know, he is in charge of you and me and of our world. It says that we know, and this is a verse we've looked at before, and we know that God causes everything to work together for the good of those who love God and are called according to his purpose. So he doesn't say everything is good, but even in the bad, God will bring good out of that. And not just in, in the world, but in, in us. It says we can rejoice too when we run into problems and trials and we know that they will develop endurance. So in the midst of the difficulty, he's working on us and we're becoming different as we allow him to. And here it says develop endurance. And endurance develops strength of character. And character strengthens our confident hope of salvation. So God is moving within us through these challenges to bring us to a place where our hope in God is strong. And then finally, that God could use the pain that we have to help others. And many of us have already lived through pain. And this is even before the virus, where maybe we've lost loved ones, we've dealt with financial setbacks, a bro broken health, broken relationships, and we've suffered great pain. And the thing about God is that he can often use that pain not only to help us, but also to help others. It says, all praise to God, the Father of our Lord Jesus Christ, God is our merciful Savior and the source of all comfort. So again, God sees us in our pain and brings us comfort. But it doesn't stop there. He comforts us in all of our troubles so that we can comfort others. And when they are troubled, we are able to give them the same comfort God has given to us. So one of the Hosannas, one of the blessings that come out of our own pain, our own hurt, the things that we struggle with, is that when we see God helping us and comforting us, that we can turn and help somebody else. Because there's a lot of people who, who need comfort, need help. And it's, it's your, your pain, your difficulty that may be the answer to that. And you've seen this happen before where someone who is divorced is able to really help someone else who's going through divorce. Or someone who is dealing with cancer is helped very much by others who have gone down that same journey. Because there's nothing that comforts you more than someone else who's been there before and has been able to keep walking and, and know that, that God is there. So you know that in your pain, your difficulty, God uses that to help others in our world. So Jesus is our Hosanna. And that that is God to the rescue for whatever it is that, that you're dealing with. 
Jesus says, I am the good shepherd, and my purpose is to give them a rich and satisfying life. So that's what Jesus is all about, that in whatever is happening, good or bad, in times of laughter or crying, that he wants to bring to us a life that is full and meaningful and rich. And it may not come in the way that we expect. It may not come in the time that we expect. But that's what Jesus ultimately delivers, is a life that, that is full and meaningful, full of meaning for each and every one of us. And how can we trust these words? He says, I am the good shepherd. And the good shepherd sacrifices his life for the sheep. And we'll see as we move through this week, we know that Jesus gave his life for us, for the world, that we might overcome challenges, that we might overcome death, and we know that he's a good shepherd. If he lay down his life for us, there's nothing that Jesus will not do for us. So I close with this in Romans 15. I pray that God, the source of hope, will fill you completely with joy and peace because you trust in him. So keep your eyes on, on Jesus, that he is a good shepherd. He is with you. He will not leave you. And he will come to your rescue and my rescue in whatever way we need. And it's in Christ alone that we find that. Dear God, we thank you for your word to us. And we pray that wherever we might need your help, your saving, your rescuing, that you would do just that. So bless us in the name of the one who comes in the name of the Lord. Amen. My name is Pastor Brian. I'm the family director here at Newark Presbyterian Church. Uh, thank you, Pastor Garrett, for a great message. He's got a little bit more to say after this. But just to let you guys know, we are posting videos for the children and for the youth. So I appreciate you guys for looking those videos out. As well as me and my team are looking to doing something special for Easter for the outreach coming up here. So keep them posted on Instagram, Facebook, your emails, and we'll let you guys know what we'll be doing. As well as looking for your family devotions. And also, remind you guys, Zoom meetings, Thursday night for youth and young adults for 11 a.m. for Sunday service as well. Also, I'll let you guys know if you appreciate this message, I pray for our ministry, pray for your children as well. But thank you very much and have a great day. Hi, we're really glad that you could join us uh, for worship today. 
And if you are encouraged by this message and the music, we hope that you will like us, uh, share with your friends, uh, leave comments, let us know what you're thinking, and then subscribe. So uh, again, we really appreciate you joining us today. And if uh, you can contribute financially, that will help to keep our church ministry moving strong. And on Thursday and Friday, we'll be posting just brief uh, reflections on communion and on uh, the cross. So we hope to see you next week on Easter uh, as we celebrate new life in Christ. But hear this benediction. May the Lord bless you and may the Lord keep you. And may the Lord make his face to shine upon you, be gracious unto you. And may the one who comes to save us, to rescue us, may he be in your life now and every day. Amen. Amen.